Hello, Professor Henry Chapman, and welcome to uh, Time Team. Congratulations from all the Time Team on your uh, professorship um, you. at Birmingham, where, which you've had for two years, which is fantastic. I've got fond memories of Birmingham. I did my first degree there. Um, but back in the day, I did English and sociology, and I can't tell you what a hippie subject that was uh, yeah, in the in the day. So, um, but uh, and what was your role on Time Team? I was the surveyor on Time Team for almost ten years, I think. Um, and uh, but I, I also did sort of introduced really digital mapping and and known as GIS. Um, so actually looking at some landscapes on a computer rather than just what Stuart was doing in, in the field. Yeah, and do you know how many episodes you did, Henry? I, oh, I, I did over 100 episodes because I remember receiving a trophy <laughs> when I got to the 100, uh, which I have on my shelf. Um, but the, uh, it was probably about 120. And I, I've tried to count the number of episodes a few times. And the, because there's a combination of normal episodes and then there are the extra specials, and uh, you know, it actually becomes quite difficult to to define what do we mean by an episode. Almost. Well, a, a hundred is definitely a long service medal. So uh, it, can you reach the thing that you got? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so see on, on the... uh, stunning. I don't know how many of those were handed out. I think that was quite a rarity. Yeah, I have no idea. I, I, I remember Kerry Kerry getting his probably more than a hundred. Yes. <laughs> yes, Kerry, it would have definitely been a recipient of one of those, I would have think. Um, your role, you've talked about uh, GIS mapping on a specific time team. We are, we're there, we've done the geophysics, we've started the excavation. When were we shouting for you and at what point did you come in? So I, I was... So the, I, I sort of had two roles. The primary role was doing the surveying, so making sure that, that that was quite often right at the very start to set out grids for geophysics and that kind of thing, um, or to to establish where a trench should go. And then throughout the process, it was continually recording trenches. So it was um, you know, and making sure that information was available, so we could always have somewhere to go back to just to see where we were effectively, because you know things could become very very busy. Um, but amongst all of that. Depending on the site, sometimes it became important to think about it, sort of step back from the trenches a little bit, or to try and understand what was in the trenches by taking a bigger perspective. Um, one of the sites I remember like that was uh, Green Island in Poole. Now, I don't remember which series it was, but um, one of the things about that site was that it was so difficult to understand on the ground, partially because it's very heavily wooded, but also because sea level had changed so dramatically since the Iron Age when you know, the site we're looking at. So to actually understand um, the, the bits of archaeology which were um, under under the sea. So you know, divers had, had found this stuff. Uh, to try and make sense of all these things, you had to kind of put it into a map. But then that map had to be in three dimensions and it had to have a level of reconstruction of you know, lowering that sea level to try and understand it. It's, it's things like that which um, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not always the first thing to do on any site, all sites. But for some sites, it becomes really helpful because it's the only way really you can get a proper context. And I, and I particularly remember what I what was always very comforting for me was the business that if we were working on a piece of archaeology, we found some structural remains or even some finds. You very quickly were able to spot, locate, if you like, those finds. Uh, in the past, we were taking coordinates from various things on the site but when you were there we could very quickly say right Henry's done these and that was seems to be a critical thing of, of what you did as well yeah I, I think one, one of the one of the great one of the many questions often get asked professionally uh, is you know, you didn't really do it in three days yeah, it, it was is that, and um, and yeah, we did, and the and, and part of the reason is because we were able to do things like that. We had, I mean, it was, it was you know, it was the team, but um, being able to immediately record something so it didn't hold you up, you know, it didn't hold up the excavation. Um, you could move, you, you you could you could lift that object because it'd been recorded. Um, and what, what was great was was working with um, with Wessex Archaeology at the um, on on the on programs because it was. I mean, that, that's the other bit I'd forgotten, actually. But at the end of the site, well, throughout and at the end, it was making sure all the archive 
all of that was recorded properly. And that was that just became a very fast process, as well as the stuff you, people saw on, on screen. It was that ability to actually finish the site and, and do that responsibly um, for, for the archive of future people. And I think, I, you know, I particularly remember you liaising with Steve Thompson, for instance. Yeah. Which was a great combination because it gave all us the security that whatever we'd done, you knew where it was, whatever we found, it had been located, and all that information transferred over to Steve so Wessex could do the reports. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was great fun working with Steve, and I've, I've seen him a few times since. And the, um, But it, it was we, we worked... I mean, one of the great things with Time Team, we work processes and we sort of created new processes. And yeah, you know, I, I use those now. You know, I, I, the stuff which, I, which we developed during Time Team, it's invaluable. And um, I suspect Steve's the same. But, the, uh, but that, that, that working together, so we, we could be very, very efficient. Um, and when you're working on a three day program um, or three day time scale, you know, that's, that's really important. And it, it, it's, but it's the same as having the other specialists on site you could get answers to questions yeah immediately you've sort of answered this question but what do you think made time team work so well over sort of 250 programs what what made it work it's um it, it was the team you know, I, I i think the thing the thing which worked really well you know we're a great team um everybody knew what they were doing everybody respected what each other were doing yeah you know, despite all the banter and everything else but um it was, it was that ability to work and, and to almost um, implicitly make changes to how we did things, you know, to always keep on pushing the efficiency, always, you know, it, was, it could be very, very highly, um, it could be very intense at times and actually having a, a good team, which you could always rely on people sort of, other people having your back almost, second guessing what was about to happen. You know, I, I think that's what made it work so well. I think the, you know, the range of personalities. I, th I think Mick was just incredible, um, as well as uh, as sort of keep holding everything together. Um, yeah, it is 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 an incredible loss. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was the team. It was the it was the shared interest. Yeah. Did you ever get a sense of? Well, I'm sure you did. A sense of satisfaction when you looked at a time team report. I, I never know how many people actually look at these things. We have to do them. I'm very, I've got shells of them. But did you ever sort of glance through them and see the detail that you delivered in those reports where Steve had sort of worked it up into the content? Yeah, no, I'm 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 really proud of the the, the reports. I mean, uh, when the the archaeology we were doing, I think was very very good, and I think the the quality of what came out of it um, was exceptional. And yeah, I when I look at those reports, when when I work on them, they're just, they are really good. Yeah, the and, and the yeah, I I think we did a good service to that side of the archaeology as well. Do you remember Greenwich? Yes, I do. Yes, Tilt Yard. Yes, I think we that was the that was the period when directors were keen on puns, so we ended up calling Joust to dig it, uh, which I was never totally sure about. What, what do you remember about Greenwich? Oh, Greenwich. I, was, the thing about Greenwich was it it came. Just started, so in the order of filming, we'd just filmed Castle Howard before. And what I remember was when, when we were at Castle Howard, we came across um, the drawings. Was it Wren's drawings in Hawksmoor? The, the, the actual drawings of Greenwich. And it, yeah, in terms of the, the architectural plans before it was built. And so it was, it was so incredible to then go to Greenwich, having just seen almost a blueprint. Uh, that, that was just, you know, coincidence maybe but yeah that's quite stunning once we got there it was such a it's such a um it's just such an incredible site i mean you've got the admiralty there you've got you know it, it, there's so much at greenwich anyway um it was i think for me it was it was you know, i hadn't worked in london many times you know we've done Vauxhall and other sites so working in london a sort of that was quite an experience but the actual site itself is it was a really interesting one because it's a very high profile story but at the same time, the archaeology was, or some of it was very ephemeral. You know, if you start talking about finding a tilt yard, that's, you know, that, that's quite ephemeral archaeology, potentially. My memory of it was a bit, it was a bit thin on the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, it, I, I suppose it, it was a shoot of um, contrast, wasn't it, in that sort of respect. But, um, but I also remember doing the, um, just the measurements to try and work out, you know, which, which building is it? I mean, it's always the thing. If you've got lots of 
relatively small trenches with bits of masonry. So well, how do they all link together? Right, and it's, you have to have to sort of stand back and try and sort of join the dots. But yeah, it's, I, I, I've really enjoyed uh, that. That series ten is great fun. That's a really good series. And did that when we found that um, the, the joust site? That's the area where the knights with because it was always that incredible contrast, as you say, between the visual images. I think we've got a Victor drawing to give us an idea of the two knights sort of coming together and all this wonderful happening. But we on the ground were looking for slightly hardened hoof print. (laughs) And and I was never quite sure whether I was totally convinced by the end. But I think Stuart and you were that, you know, we had actually found something because of its dimensions, I think. Yeah. No, the the, the, the dimension, I mean, this this is great working with, um, uh, you know, with with architectural historians, you know, getting... um, I mean, I, I, again, it's one of those great beauties of time. If I'd been working on that as a site, um, I would never have known to, that that was a question I could have asked. Yeah, it's this range of expertise. So, so when you have somebody saying, oh, okay, they've got to be, I don't know how many metres it was, you know, the dimensions are standard or well recorded, then suddenly that gives you a whole new way of actually looking at the evidence. So assume that's correct, then therefore, actually, if the measurements all, all stack up, and I, if I remember rightly, they're, they're like to the centimeter or something ridiculously spot on you know in a way which is like i can't be right um but yeah so that it's, it's, it's that combination of skills i mean like, like those it, I, I always get shocked by I, expertise people are really good at what they do and um and they understand enough about what you do or what i do and then they can sort of yeah and they can make the link yeah it's it's like magic, isn't it? It's like sort of alchemy. <laughs> I, don't know. I always thought the time team had a certain sort of apres ski element to it, where having we'd finished the dig and everything, we would then go back to the hotel and various characters would, uh, I'd usually try and go to bed early, but inevitably <laughs> these things could go until, th- I remember there seemed to be some event around changing beds, which you were the subject of at one point. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I remember this one, yeah, alarmingly. So this was this was in that might have been the Fettler shoot. It was up it was Scotland. And it was oh god, that was um yeah, a variety of things. We we we, we had it was it's one of those places absolutely beautiful, yeah, stunning scenery. And the hotel was made of a number of, of like, lodges which were all facing inwards at each other, which always seemed a bit bizarre. Um but there was there was Oh, the, the, the all sorts of things, climbing through windows and rearranging people. I mean, it's completely childish. It's brilliant. Um, and I think my favourite one was um, with, oh, Name Me No Names with Kerry, um, <laughs> which was uh, we, we had the radios from from sites. And, uh, and be, be, because he had the different channels, and one of them was just radio to radio, um, you know, just line of sight. And Kerry had managed to get in through the window of, Somebody, I think it's Kerry. Uh, who, who's it? Um, so I just said some somebody's room. They basically put it, it put a radio under the bed, so he waited until quite late and then pretended to be a ghost. And because everybody had been drinking, this was they had the desired effect. <laughs> so having the voice coming from under the bed as he's talking to them, yeah, very, very silly. <laughs> it all made sense after a drink. <laughs> oh, it did. Um, so you're at Birmingham now, you've been mm. there for a while. Um, what what's the next stage for you and the projects that are really making you excited about? If we were making a film of something, where would you like to take us and, and which project would you like us to follow? Hmm. Well, it's, I, I, I think, I mean, I'm working on a, on a range of projects. I mean, I think um, top of the list for me, yeah, if I'm really selfish with that, I'd, I'd probably be looking at the bog bodies work I've been doing in Denmark. Primarily in Denmark and elsewhere, but and what um, is that in detail? How? What do you mean the bog bodies work? So, so, uh, so bog bodies being sort of preserved remains of humans in in peat bogs, um, and one of the big debates they, is dates Henry from where well, the, the, they the earliest ones Mesolithic. So, but they but they're always considered to be a sort of Iron Age, later prehistoric kind of phenomenon. That there are later ones as well. Um, but what, what, one of the big debates, particularly for the Iron Age ones, is are they victims of human sacrifice? 
um because you know, for a number of reasons sometimes they're naked they're brutally killed and all the rest of it um but one of the things which hasn't been looked at um until we, we started has been whereabouts in the bog what's the bog like there's sort of landscape context if you imagine sort of Stuart coming to the to the role with an environmental archaeologist it's is that um and the reason why it's really important is that obviously if it's a very wet and treacherous landscape um if you're going to murder somebody which is one of the possible interpretations you're probably not going to walk right into the middle of a dangerous bog so you know, where where the individual is on the middle or edge if it's a normal grave it's probably more likely to be on the edge you know there's you know, we can start thinking about that context so trying to understand, you know, the work I've been doing has been trying to understand, well, what is the context of that body find? And because environments change through time, you know, the bogs grow and then they're cut back. Where was the actual edge of the bog in the Iron Age? Nobody ever asked these questions. You know, was it on the edge or was it in the middle? Um, and this, this really helps in terms of interpretation. But I think, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to expand that to the landscape around it and, and to broaden that. So, I mean, that's, that selfishly, I mean, that's an area which I'd love to, I'd love to throw the throw time to maps. Um, but but equally, I mean, working there's so many other questions. I mean, I, I have projects working in um, basically hill forts in bogs, so Iron Age again, uh, which again, there's it's a big landscape. It goes the great thing with time went from the very very sort of minute, you know, the object, all the way through to the landscape, and I think, and it's seamless really, and I think that approach. To either of those two topics is really valuable, um, but even you know the work I've been doing at Stonehenge, you know, actually the idea of you know, most of the work we've been doing has been very heavily geophysical. It's been um, uh, it's been very much on that, that that end of things. And I think well, if you broaden the team in the way which any time team can do, suddenly you have all those inputs all at once, and then it's it makes it more alive rather than sort of you do this, you interpret it, then you talk to people. What happens is you do it, talk to people, continue doing it change what you're doing it's it's that which i think yeah that's that's the disruptive kind of exciting thing about working like time team and i think somebody um i think the new scientist or something referred to it being a sort of testing of numerous hypotheses that you know while we're there we'd start with an idea that would be hypothesis a and we'd be get to f and g testing each one on the ground at the time they also described it as a good illustration of heisenberg's uncertainty principle <laughs> not quite sure what they were getting at but uh, we never quite knew did we did we, whether or not we find so how are you coping at the moment henry you've got students out there and you're doing uh, lectures on zoom or something what's your daily routine yeah, daily routine is a it's a lot of Zoom, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of lectures like that. There's a lot of recording lectures. Um, what, I mean, what, what we're doing, like many universities, is trying to be a few weeks ahead, just you know, to cover all certainties. There's still face to face bits, but it's the face to face teaching is is um, it's quite bizarre because you know, we, in Birmingham we do quite a lot of small group teaching. Yeah, you know, ten students, twelve students. Um, but you imagine because of social distancing, we now have that in a huge lecture theatre. So, so you've still got your small class, but there's like distributed right, right across. So, so there's um, six of you in a space that would have taken 200. Yeah, yeah, precisely. So, yeah, that, that's, that's a bit odd. Um, we don't get the students sitting on the back row, thankfully. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's working, I think. Um, and, but, it's, yeah, it's very odd. Yeah, and how many students going through your courses at the moment at Birmingham? Um, so in terms of our, you know, our, our, our archaeology, sort of directly related, probably um, uh, about 25 a year in, in groups of undergraduate. But of course, we, we're, we're teaching archaeology modules to a vast, you know, much bigger range of, of topics, you know, a lot of other, other degree programmes. Uh, then you've got the postgrads as well, the PhD. I and mean, one of the challenges at the moment is... Um, postgraduates getting out to do field work yeah just those you know those other little elements but you know things things are working i think um and it i mean it's rather nice for me to think about my old stamping ground at birmingham i've talked to a lot of people um about the archaeological science element of what's been done there the the unit i think vince gaffney was there he's gone somewhere else now but there was a there's always been an interest in if you like 
I suppose the, the tradition when I was there was that Birmingham had all these arts and things, but it always had its feet in the science of, if you like, the industrial base of Birmingham. Mm. And so they were always interested in the, the, the more sort of scientific applications going alongside the main subjects, because I think you're still in archaeology classics and something or other, aren't you? Actually, yeah. So that's a big, you know, classical, typical degree. But it's very exciting to think of these new developments. And have you got computer centers and scientists who are doing all sorts of things that you can call on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the, I mean, one, one, at, at one level, there's so much more you can do without having to have a huge resource, which is, which is one benefit. Um, but yeah, through, through, through projects, we sort of built other sorts of computing resources and, and got equipment, um, got a good relationship with the geographers, you know, because they're sort of their, their kindred spirits in many ways. Um, you often, so in, I think, feel unloved sometimes, the geographers, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 geography I, teaching at school, I think. But um, yes, I'm, I'm glad the geographers have been brought in. <laughs> No, it's, it's 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 always nice to one of the geographers. I mean, and and sharing sharing comments about whatever whatever you're moaning about. But what 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 often happens? You'll be talking about the thing which you know I'll be moaning about whatever restriction I like, you know, and and they'll be moaning about something else. And then as soon as they hear my moan, they say, "Oh no, we solved that. This is what you do." <laughs> <laughs> so far, it's very handy. <laughs> I'm going to give you time, team, for a week. You can take the whole team with all the technology you like anywhere any site in say let's say europe for now where would you want us to go we call these a sort of fantasy sites mm. um oh I've, I've, I've got various ones i mean just so um so this is slightly long-winded but the um a colleague asked me recently and said what why, why do we keep on working at stonehenge because it's had more people work at stonehenge than anywhere else on the planet um, you know, surely we should free up some of that funding and everything else and go somewhere else. But what we found from all intense work at Stonehenge is actually, if you do throw a resource at a single site, you get so much more. You know, it's more, you know, it's more than some of the parts. It's there's no diminishing returns. Um, so Stonehenge, actually, I'll I'd, I'd, I'd go for something like that, um, possibly. But fantastic, Henry. Thank you very much, Professor Henry Chapman from Birmingham University. I'm pleased to say. Uh, delighted to talk. Uh, we could probably go on for a while discussing various members of Time Team, but oh, yeah, that's yeah. no, really good seeing them. Thank you for your time. Lovely to hear from you, and uh, I think it was great that role that you and Steve and and came into with the team, and and the way the team appreciated it, um, because however testy we might get to get you in to get your points or the thing drawn, the thing located, we all knew that it was a, an essential part of what we did. And uh, I th uh, that was a great contribution. So yeah, I look you. forward to talking to you in the future. Oh, yeah. but, uh, perhaps seeing you out there in the field with as many technical machines as we can get in the truck as possible. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Henry. Thanks.